Hey guys, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with my vacation book haul or my Italy book haul, let's call it. So as many of you know, or you know anyway, if you've seen a video on this channel in the past month, uh, I have been out of town for the past couple of weeks and I went to Italy. So I was very, very lucky. I got to go to Florence, Siena, Luca and Rome. Uh, I initially was not supposed to go to Rome. I had plans to go to an area along the coast called the Cinque Terre, but unfortunately weather was terrible. Um, it rained nearly every single day and it was forecast to rain every single day while I was there across the entire Italian peninsula. Uh, and I'm sure some of you have seen the absolutely horrible flooding that they are experiencing right now in Venice. So I made last minute changes to my plans. So I decided to go to Rome and then I finished up with literally three hours in Milan because I had to fly in and out of Milan. Uh, so these are books that I got along the way. I got them in Florence, Siena, uh, Rome, and I did get one final book in Milan and I will tell you a little bit about the bookstores as we go through these books. They are all Italian themed, Italian history themed, Renaissance themed, if you will, because that's kind of the mood that I was in while I was there. Uh, so let's just get started with the haul. The first book that I picked up was in Florence, and this is The Lives of the Artists by Giorgio Vasari. This was a title that I had my eye on and that I knew that I really wanted to get when I was in Florence because Giorgio Vasari is from Florence. He is also a Renaissance artist, though he is sometimes termed um, a member of the Mannerist School, which are the artists that came immediately after the big giants of the Renaissance age. Mannerism is no longer a term that is used quite so frequently anymore, especially in modern art circles, because it's almost looked at as derogatory. They bridged the gap between Renaissance and Baroque. Uh, and so Vasari, his whole life, he was a little bit of a copyist. And so from the time of a young child, he would travel around, he would see all these great pieces of art uh, from people like Giotto or from, you know, older artists such as that who were really starting the Renaissance in the 1300s and early 1400s. And he would copy their art into his art book, into his journal. Actually, I misspoke. I believe Vasari is from Arezzo, which is very close to Florence, but is not talked about to the same extent. Uh, so he was somebody who lived in Arezzo, but eventually moved into the Florence area. So he was certainly from Tuscany, but he clearly had a background knowledge of all of the artists. And one day he's just kind of having a discussion with somebody about a project to undertake a series of biographies on all of the big name Renaissance artists. Uh, and Vasari commits to this, and that is what this book is. This is volume one. There is a volume two. And unfortunately, this is heavily, heavily edited. There are far more artists in Vasari's original manuscript and the original uh, untranslated Lives of the Artists that has made it into English. George Bull, the translator of the edition that I have chose to cut a lot of the artists that we no longer view as um, big names of the Renaissance. So he really wanted to focus on those that we still think of as genius rather than those that Vasari clearly had great opinions of at the time in the 1500s, which I think is a shame. I understand why it was done because otherwise the book would be 2000 pages long and we don't want that either, but this has been endlessly fascinating. I'm currently reading this, and this is not a review. I know I should save it for my wrap up, but this has been endlessly fascinating. This is a great addition to my nonfiction November uh, TBR. I have loved every minute of this. I'm going to continue tabbing it. I'm gonna continue taking notes. I've been taking vigorous notes. Uh, Vasari has been an excellent teacher. At the same trip, to this bookstore, which is called Paperback Exchange. If you ever go to Florence, this is an English language bookstore called the Paperback Exchange. It's very close to literally anything that you wanna see. But also on this trip, I got another book that was definitely on my list, and that is Jacob Burkhart's The Civilization of Renaissance Italy. 
I believe this is one of the books that coined the term Renaissance in the 19th century. Of course, building off of the great Giorgio Vasari, who mentioned that they were experiencing a rebirth in art. Renaissance essentially means rebirth. Um, so I think this is one of those books and one of those histories that really informed the way that we think about the period today in a similar way to Vasari. I'm sorry, I'm gonna keep going on about him. The man was a genius. Um, Vasari's Lives of the Artist kind of defined our list of the greats. When we think of Renaissance art and architecture, he is the one who picked out the names that we remember. And I think in a similar way, Jacob Burkhart does something like that here. And I think he talks a little bit too about the later medieval period and how that informed the Renaissance and the birth of the Renaissance, which I really, really appreciate. Uh, I love the Renaissance, but in a lot of Renaissance histories, you have this kind of prevailing opinion, which is present in Vasari, that of course the Dark Ages were incredibly dark and there were no movements in art. There was no art at all. It was really kind of this death of classicism. And in fact, when you view it as this change from classics to a very dark style of art, you are correct. But to say that there was no art in the Middle Ages is so terrible. Uh, you were overlooking so much beauty, so much uniqueness. There's especially a lot of unique medieval art across the countries like France, the Netherlands, uh, Belgium. They really experienced something special during the period we would call the Dark Ages. Uh, so I don't like that attitude. But uh, I think that he is really going to discuss how specifically people like Dante and Petrarch and Boccaccio from the later Middle Ages, they were the beginning of what we think of as the Italian Renaissance, especially in terms of writing, of course. They were all writers. Petrarch was a poet, but he was the first of the humanists. The humanist movement was a big deal and a big part of the Italian Renaissance specifically. Um, Dante was a poet. But Dante was also an artist. And we'll get to that because the next thing I have to talk about, Dante. Uh, so I'm excited to get to this, especially because it is so short. I didn't expect it to be as small as it is, as slim as it is. I'm sure it packs a punch. Uh, and I was so lucky. I got to see this art piece in person. This is from the Journey of the Magi in the Palazzo Medici. Uh, which is actually near where my hotel was. Uh, and so that's Giuliano de' Medici with, isn't that great? Isn't that like a little tiny leopard? Great, fabulous. I saw that art piece in person. It's in there, the Medici Chapel, and it's all four walls of the chapel. It is stunning. It is just beautiful. Uh, so I was really thrilled about that. So the next day I thought, hey, my book buying in Florence is done. I'm happy with everything that I've gotten two books, that's enough, that's all I need from Florence. <laughs> no, I went to the Dante's House Museum, which I intended to go to the first time that I went to Florence, but I've always been under the impression that Dante did not live in that house. Uh, and as a matter of fact, members of his extended family did in fact live in that house and that neighborhood where the Dante's House Museum is, is a neighborhood that is very medieval in structure and in character. So it is something that Dante very much would have recognized. And the house is across the street from the Chiesa di Dante, which is the church where Dante supposedly first set eyes on his muse, Beatrice, or in Italian, she's called Beatrice. I love it. I am obsessed with that. And Beatrice is buried inside the church. Uh, so it's certainly an area that he was very, very familiar with. And you were walking the streets that he walked. It's incredible. But it was an excellent museum. Uh, and I made the whole trip in Florence about Dante. I was just thinking about Dante the whole time I was there. I was very, very emotional. Uh, and I was emotional in his house. And so I walked out with a biography of Dante by Barbara Reynolds. Uh, and she's one of the preeminent Dante scholars out there today. Uh, and so this is one of the more recently published biographies of Dante. I believe it was published in 2006. So I was going to say only a few years ago, but basically 
13 years ago. That is wild, isn't it? That is just wild. I keep thinking 2000 was 10 years ago, but I'm wrong. So this is talking about Dante and his life outside of writing uh, and outside of the Divine Comedy specifically, because Dante lived an incredibly eventful life. He was a political figure. He was an artist. He was a soldier. Uh, he was really a jack of all trades, someone we might term a Renaissance man long, long prior to that phrase ever being coined. Uh, but you know I love Dante, so I love everything about him. All of his controversial bits too. But uh, there's a lot in his life that can be very confusing, specifically for new readers. It's hard to remember what side in politics Dante came down on. It's hard to remember why he was exiled. Uh, and so all of the events of his life really informed the Divine Comedy in an extreme way. Uh, and I think it will be beneficial to me before I start my reread of the Divine Comedy to read a biography of him and re-familiarize myself with his life and events that happened to him. I love Dante and it's really probably the number one reason why I love Florence and why I want to be in Florence is because I think of Dante when I am there. Uh, so I am extremely happy to have this. So of course I left the Dante house high on love for Dante. I saw the Ponte Vecchio, which is where Beatrice supposedly acknowledged Dante for the first time. I saw Dante's death mask at the Palazzo Vecchio. I was very emotional and I felt like I can't leave the city of his soul without his writing. Uh, and so I went back to paperback exchange and I got the portable Dante uh, and I'm so happy to have this. This is in the translation of Dante that I've read before, which is by Mark Musa. Uh, and I initially was not gonna buy another version of Dante unless I could get a different translator. I really wanted to try a different translation of him in recent years, but this is something that I know that I don't acknowledge often enough and probably most of us don't, but the reason why I fell in love with Dante was because I read this translation. And I don't know that had I read Longfellow's translation that I would have felt that love and connection with him the way that I did through Mark Muses. So it made sense to me to get the translation that I've read before. Uh, and especially because this is essentially everything that he wrote in one book. So this is the Divine Comedy, Inferno, Purgatorio, Paradiso, and La Vita Nuova, which is a series of poems that are really, really beautiful. Dante has some other writings and some essays that uh, have not been translated into English very recently, I think. And certainly Mark Musa has not translated them, so that's why they're not in here. Two entirely different pictures of him here. This is kind of his idealized statue out in front of Santa Croce in Florence. Uh, and this is one of the more famous paintings of him. I adore Dante. I'm ready to get right back into him. I started reading this the second that I left the bookstore. And I just wanted to cry. I just love him so much. So of course, in talking about this haul, if you want to take my recommendation for something, read Dante, try him. Just give him a try in the Mark Musa or the Mendelbaum translation, and I'm sure that you will fall in love with him. Uh, just be prepared to do your research on the side. So next I went to Siena, which is a very, very medieval city on a hilltop in Tuscany. I loved every second of it there. Uh, I'm really, really in love with Siena. I'm so glad that I went, and I'm so glad that I plan to spend multiple days there because it really deserved it in my opinion. I am far more of a medieval girl than I am a Renaissance girl. It's hard for me to say, even even in Italy where Renaissance art is at its finest, but I am at home in a medieval city and literally everything that you pass in Siena was built in like the 11 or 1200s. It is stunning. I mean, it's just incredible. If you have the opportunity to go, I encourage you to go. An incredibly hilly city steep inclines, but worth it. Definitely worth the work. So the first thing that I bought there were St. Catherine of Siena's letters. So St. Catherine is of course from Siena. And I got this English translation of her letters from the Church of San Domenico, uh, which 
is a church that she would have been familiar with and that she would have gone to. And she definitely spent time with medieval popes and she informed a lot of decisions and she really helped move the papacy from Avignon back into Rome. Uh, so she was an incredibly important historical figure, but I know that her writings are really, really moving to a lot of people and have meant a lot to a lot of people, even those who were not Catholic. Uh, and I am not Catholic, I am Protestant, but I find the saints fascinating. I specifically find Catherine fascinating because the female saints are just really interesting to me and the women wielding this power, specifically in the medieval period. Uh, and Catherine of Siena was a very powerful figure. Uh, so it's interesting. And this book was printed by the Church of San Domenico and all of the uh, proceeds go back to the church. They have a goal to make St. Catherine of Siena known worldwide. So they have her letters in a bunch of different translations. Really, really interesting, very kind people there. Uh, and so I'm excited to read these. Um, St. Catherine was not actually literate until very late in her life. And even then she preferred to dictate her letters to other people who wrote them down for her. So I have been told or warned about going into this and expecting something like poetry. She was not a poet. She was a lay woman. And so I find that even more meaningful. I just can't wait to get into this. I hope that I fall in love with her and fall in love with her writing as much as other people have. I really think that I'm going to enjoy this. Uh, and they gave me this bookmark with her most famous prayer in Italian and English on the back. Incredible. I was really excited to be there and to be in the Church of San Domenico. Beautiful, beautiful church. The reason why Siena never reached the level of power as something like her sister city, Florence, well, not really her sister city, just her close by city, Florence, uh, is because Siena was devastated by the Black Death in 1348. Uh, and so much of the city is essentially frozen in time. Uh, the Duomo there, their cathedral, uh, it's absolutely beautiful, but it was intended to be a much smaller part of a larger complex. And so the cathedral that is there now was meant to be essentially, I think, the left part of the nave of a much longer and larger church that they never finished building because of the Black Death. Uh, and I found that very interesting. I found everything that I saw in Siena incredibly interesting, specifically at their city hall which is this kind of iconic building on the Piazza del Campo with the very large tower, the Torre del Mancha. Uh, and it was a beautiful, beautiful city hall with a lot of history there that I knew nothing about. And I said, I just need a book on all of this. I find all of this absolutely fascinating. Uh, and so this was recommended to me. This is Siena, the history of a medieval commune uh, by, what's his name? Ferdinand Chevelle, Chevelle? This was sold to me as the best history of Siena that you could possibly get in English translation. Uh, so I'm excited to get into this. It's also not very large, but I think this will be very interesting reading because Siena is a place that even though I knew I really wanted to go and I know some of the big names of Siena, some of the big artists, um, I don't know much about their very early history, and I'm specifically interested in learning a little bit more about the Black Death. I mean, that's kind of exciting, isn't it? The plague, we just all get really excited about the plague. <laughs> so then I went to Lucca. I did not buy any books in Lucca. I only had a couple of days there and I, they were really washed out, unfortunately. But I didn't get any books in Lucca, so the next place that I got some books was Rome. Uh, I am very disappointed in myself because I had a lot on my list for books that I wanted to get in Rome. I saw them all actually in a museum bookstore at the Capitoline Museum there in Rome. And I said, I'm not carrying these around all day. I will find them at a bookstore. I'm sure that they're all over the bookstores. So I went to two bookstores in Trastevere, which is a neighborhood in Rome on, I want to say, the left bank of the Tiber. When you were looking at a map of Rome, it is on the left. Uh, Trastevere is a very old part of the city. 
and has a lot of incredibly old churches, most of them founded in the three and four hundreds. Incredible place to be, really incredible part of town. So the first bookstore that I went to there was a used bookstore and it had used Italian books and used English books. So I got The Raven's Head by Karen Maitland. I have never heard of this author. I had never heard of this book, but it sounds like it's something that's up my alley because it's termed a historical thriller and it takes place in the 1200s in Norfolk, England and has to do with alchemy and the Philosopher's Stone. It just sounds really, really good. She had several other books listed in the front flap of this, so I am really hoping that this is not in the middle of a series and that I need a lot of background knowledge to get into this. This was the only non-Renaissance book that I got, really only non-fiction book that I got, aside from Dante. Karen Maitland must be an English or British author. That's the only thing I can assume because I've never seen her books here in the States. So I find that really interesting. I'm excited to get into her. Hopefully I like her and I have a new author to binge read. Then I went to a bookstore that was right in the square of Santa Maria in Trastevere, which is truly one of the most spectacular churches I have ever seen in my life. I was in that church for two hours. I was mesmerized every minute of being there. I just cried, I just cried and cried and cried. This was a really emotional trip of me crying in churches, but I really cried in Santa Maria and Tristevere. But the little bookstore near there had this book, which is called Renaissance People, Lives That Shaped the Modern Age. Uh, and so this is essentially a series of minute biographies of a bunch of different names from the Renaissance period uh, that have shaped our modern world. Uh, so some of these are, of course, names you know, the Medici, um, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Botticelli, Brunelleschi, uh, but several are names that I had never heard of and so I'm really interested in those and a lot of them are women. I think this is going to be a really really interesting read and it's going to be one that I like because I always like to keep a nonfiction going where you read a chapter and sit it down. Uh, this is going to be absolutely perfect for that. And last but not least, I went to Milan for, like I said, three hours. I really went to Milan to sleep, wake up, and go to the airport the next morning. So I got The Ugly Renaissance by Alexander Lee, and I got this at a bookstore called La Fetronelli. And La Fetronelli, or Fel Feltronelli, I'm, I'm not really sure now which one it was. But this is a chain of bookstores akin to a Barnes & Noble here in the States, or a Waterstones, I would say, but it's in Italy, and they have a lot of foreign language books. I really like those bookstores. I find them to be incredibly well laid out. I went in several. But this is supposedly going to tell us the terrible side of the Renaissance. All sorts of stuff that we don't talk about when we talk about the Renaissance. We typically talk about a very clean, wonderful beauty, um, the bright colors, the paintings, and this is really gonna show us the dark side to the lives of Renaissance artists, Renaissance princes, everything like that. Uh, so I am excited about this. Like, I am really excited about it. I think they're going to badmouth Michelangelo, though, and like, wait, don't do that in front of me, okay? You get me? Like, we all have our historical faves. I will defend Michelangelo against, I will defend Michelangelo against a legitimate Renaissance historian. I will do it. So don't tempt me, Alexander Lee. Don't tempt me. So that was a really long haul for only nine books, but I am really thrilled with all of them. And I could just wax poetic about this time period for a really long time. Uh, so get ready for it. I probably will have a Renaissance historical series in the future on my channel, probably in the new year. If you have read any of these, please let me know down below. Uh, if you have been to Italy, I would love to know where you've been in Italy, where you're in love with. I am a little bit of a Rome kind of girl. I'm interested to hear what your favorite place in Italy is. If you haven't been to Italy, tell me whether you would like to go or not and where you would like to go. Uh, but that's gonna be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading, goodbye.